Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. After listening to Morgan's performance and, and seeing all the college students who are going to be attending school for the first time, I think I'm about to cry. So you be patient with me this morning if I shed a tear or two. If you have a copy of God's word with you this morning, I invite you to turn in there with me to Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16. Today we'll be discussing and reviewing together a proverb that I'm sure most, if not all of you, have committed to memory in one form or another. Proverbs chapter 16, proverb number 18 in that chapter. Pride is a problem with painful results. Pride is a problem with painful results. Hear the word of the Lord for you this morning. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. That's it. Will you pray with me? Father, teach us great and incredible truths contained in your word. Help us to leave this place changed, impacted by what we have learned, Lord God, and Help us to be a people who are more glorifying, God glorifying and God exalting every day because we encountered you through your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. And all who are God's people said, Amen. Amen. Will Smith is one of the best known celebrities in the world. He has starred in some of the biggest blockbusters in in movie history, and his marriage to Jada Pinkett Smith is, is the tough of tabloid fare. But before Will Smith was this celebrity blockbuster movie star, but before he married Jada, before he was the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Will Smith was simply known as the Fresh Prince, a, a storytelling rapper in my house. I couldn't listen to gangster rap, so, so I was forced to listen to Will Smith, the Fresh Prince, and, and he actually became one of my favorite hip-hop stars of, of all time. I, I love a number of his songs. Parents just don't understand a, a nightmare on my street. Girls ain't nothing but trouble, but undoubtedly my favorite Will Smith song of all time is I Think I can beat Mike Tyson. Do any of you remember that? The, the song is actually a story where after watching a, a Mike Tyson fight, where a Mike Tyson fight where Mike Tyson purportedly knocked someone's head into the 18th row of the bleachers, Will Smith, upon seeing that, convinced himself that he could beat Mike Tyson in a boxing match. Mike Tyson at that time was the heavyweight champion of the world, the most ferocious puncher that boxing had seen in, in the past two decades, a fighter who routinely knocked out his opponents in the first round. Yes, that Mike Tyson was the person that Will Smith said he could beat in a fight. And in fact, he said he only needed a few months to train and after training for a few months, he, he was now prepared to face the heavyweight champion of the world. Will Smith, in the song, said he walked into the ring weighing a light 165 pounds compared to Mike Tyson, who was weighing 200 and 
20 pounds. You already know the results. The results were predictable. In a line to one of the, in, to, in a line to the song, Smith says that one punch is all it took. He hit me in my ribs and my insides shook. And after experiencing one round of fighting Mike Tyson, Will Smith decided that running was the best thing that he can do. He, he decided to preserve his health while sacrificing he, his dignity. He wrote, according to the song, it is better to take a bad stand, it is better to have a good run than to take a bad stand any day. What would make a 165 pound man believe that he could challenge and defeat the heavyweight champion of the world? You already know the answer. An excessively high and unrealistic opinion of himself and his abilities, and in other words, Pride. Pride can give us a false impression of ourselves that lead us to assuming challenges that are too vast for us to handle. Pride can supercharge our ego so that we believe nothing is outside of our abilities. And pride can overinflate our opinions of ourselves until we fall flat into disaster. Fortunately for Will Smith, the, the song, I Think I Can Beat Mike Tyson, is, is just that. It's a song. The events of that song never really happened. They, they didn't take place. In his bout with pride, Will Smith did not believe that he could actually beat Mike Tyson, which would have eventually led to disaster. But unfortunately for us, we may not be so lucky in our bouts with pride. Proverbs are short, pithy, wise observations designed to instruct encourage, admonish, or to warn. Every culture at every point in time in its history has had proverbs of their own. In ancient Israel, they collected a series of proverbs and put it in book form, a book that comes to us in 31 chapters known as the Book of Proverbs. These proverbs were designed to instruct. They, they read like a father giving careful instructions to his son. The father knows that for the, in order for the son to be successful in life, that he must learn valuable lessons. These valuable lessons come in the form of lectures. And one of the things that the father constantly warns his son against is about the dangers of pride. There are over eight references to pride in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 6, 16 through 19 lists pride as being one of the seven things that are detestable to God. Proverbs 11, 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Proverbs 15, 25 says, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Proverbs 21, four says, a high look and a proud heart is sin. But of all these references to pride that we find in the book of Proverbs, the most popular and well-known comes to us in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride goes before destruction. Proverbs 16, 18 is a warning of the potential dangers that come in line for the proudful person. And if this proverb sounds familiar to you, it's because it should. The secular world has kidnapped this proverb and claimed it as one of its own. You, you hear it repeated regularly in the form of pride comes before a fall. Many people who quote this proverb aren't even aware that it comes from the Bible. That proverb is a generic warning about the problem of pride, how for prideful people, it can lead to problems in their relationships. But in the context of the Bible, when Proverbs speaks of pride and when the Bible in general speaks of pride, it's not only addressing the issues that pride can have with and to other people, it's also addressing the issues that prideful people have with God. 
pride is not just a secular problem. Pride is a spiritual problem. The prideful person thinks that they don't need God, and a prideful person thinks that he can exist in life without the help of God. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. Pride is the complete antidote, anti-God state of mind. When Proverbs 16, 18 speaks of the dangers of pride, it's not only saying that pride is a problem with people, it's also saying that people who are prideful have a problem with God. People who are prideful have a problem with other people and they have a problem with God because they refuse to accept godly instruction. It is a difficult for a, proud per for a proud person to hear and accept helpful and corrective instructions because prideful people always view corrective speech as criticism. Criticism is the disapproval of someone or something based on perceived fault and the Bible speaks against criticism. Remember Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew that you should judge not, lest ye be judged. This is a warning against criticism. Corrective speech, however, is something that the Bible applauds. As brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to one another. When we see them doing damaging behavior that could hurt themselves, to speak and try to hold people accountable. Galatians 6.1 says that if we find a brother caught in sin, that it is our responsibility to attempt to restore this person back to health. A prideful person will have none of this because corrective speech to a prideful person sounds like criticism. When you try to correct a prideful person, they assume that you are insulting them or degrading them. A, a prideful person believes that they have no need to be corrected because they believe that they are never wrong. In his book, Character Coins, Robert E. Reed says this about pride. Pride knows it all, has seen it all, and has done it all. Pride isn't in interested in anything else except being right, being heard, being first, and being on top. People with pride know everything without ever learning anything. This is why the book of Proverbs says that you're just wasting your time trying to correct a prideful person. It says in Proverbs 13, 10, that where there is strife, there is pride. But wisdom is found in those who take advice. Prideful people will sooner try to fight you than to take godly instruction. Prideful people have a problem with other people and they have a problem with God because they reject instruction. And prideful people have a problem with other people and have a problem with God because they reject authority. Prideful people don't want to hear what you have to say to them and prideful people never want to submit to anyone. They foolishly believe that they are in charge of all things, even when they are not in charge. They suffer from a lack of submission, whether it's to their boss at work, whether it's to an adult over them, or whether it's even to God. The minute you try to tell a prideful person what to do, it's all over, because they will reject any legitimate authority over them. And in fact, in ancient Greek, pride was seen as a crime because pride was seen as a refusal to accept authority. In the ancient Greek world, whenever you committed an offense such as vandalism or even, such sex, or even sexual assault, you were convicted and tried not under those crimes but under pride because in ancient Greek world they believed that a prideful person would not submit to the authority of the state. It was pride that led Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden to reject the authority of God, believing that they could survive and do things on their own. And, and in his famous epic poem, Paradise Lost, John Milton says that it was pride 
that drove Satan to engage in a coup against God. Satan, according to Milton, was the second most beautiful and second most prominent figure in heaven next to only God. But, but he didn't want to be second. He rejected the authority of, of even God and tried to orchestrate a coup. You know what happened then. He, he was discharged from heaven. But when he left, he famously said this, better to reign in hell than to serve in heaven. And there are many of us who have that same attitude. We want our small state, regardless of how vulnerable and insignificant it is, all because we want our opinion to be the only opinion that matters, and we will reject the authority of anyone else. Prideful people have a problem with other people and have a problem with God because they reject instruction. They will reject authority, and they will deny help the confession, the admit, admitting that we need help can be the, one of the most humbling experiences that we'll go through in life. The, the very act of confessing that we need help is, is, is admitting to something, admitting that there are things outside of our power. There, there, there are things in situations that we experience that we cannot control, that, that there are things that we will go through in life that we cannot handle on our own. Sometimes the most humbling thing in the world to do is to ask someone else for help. They, they say confession is good for the soul, but it's also sometimes bad for the reputation. But, but Central, can I, can I share with you a, a page out of my journal of my journeys with God? Uh, I was in Chicago. I was there for about two years. Christy and I had had been married for one year when my mentor came into town. He was having a very important meeting with Moody Publishing, and I asked him, could, could I drive him to the publishing house? I would make sure that he would get to his meeting right on time. And, and he asked me, did I know where Moody Publishing was? And I said, of course I know where Moody Publishing is. I'm, I'm the king of this city. I will get you there in time. Don't worry about it. So, I picked him up about an hour before his appointment at Moody Publishing, and 15 minutes into our ride, it became apparent that I had no clue where I was going, but I refused to ask for help. The pride in me told me that, that if I admitted that I was lost, that he would disrespect me, he, he wouldn't have the same type of respect that he, he had for me. He asked me, John, can, can, can I help you? Can, can I look on my phone? I said, no. Don't worry about it. I know where I'm going. 30 minutes into the ride. Said again, John, let me help you. I have a phone. I've been to Moody Publishing before. I know where it's at. I told him, no. I know exactly where I'm at. 45 minutes later, I, I, I saw a marker that I recognized. Got off the expressway, and we made it to Moody Publishing. In 45 minutes, he was just in time for his meeting. I waited for him after his meeting, and I said, Pastor, are, are, are you ready to go back to your hotel? And he said, absolutely. This time, John, can you please let me help you? Let me tell you which way we're going. I, I, I finally humbled myself and said, all right, yes, you can help me. Told us to... He told me to get out of the parking lot, make a right turn. This is a true story, Central. We made a right turn, drove a block. And then he told me to make a left turn. We made a left turn, drove five more blocks, and there was the Four Seasons Hotel that he was staying in. The hotel was really just seven blocks away. But it took me 45 minutes to get there because I refused to ask for help. Pride, my pride was too great. And giving pride can have that type of effect on people. People will refuse to ask for much, much, much needed help because pride convinces them that they don't need anybody's help. Pride convinces them that they can do things on their own 
pride tells them that they could accomplish anything in life by themselves. Given the problem that prideful people have with, with p other people and with God, it's not surprising what Proverbs 16, 18 tells us will be the result of pride in the lives of prideful people. Pride will eventually lead to destructions. Proverbs aren't promises. They're, they're, they're not certainties. They're not guarantees. Proverbs are just generic and general truths that most of the time will occur. But in the case of Proverbs 16, 18, you can take this to the bank. Prideful people will face destruction not some of the time, not most of the time, but all of the time. Prideful people will experience pain, no doubt about it. The word destruction translates a Hebrew word that means shattering or, or, or breaking. It, it can be used literally as with the breaking of a bone or, or the shattering of a pot. Or it could be used figuratively as in the breaking of a relationship. Either sense of that word applies in Proverbs 16, 18. Pride will lead to you either breaking your heart, breaking your property, breaking your bank account, or breaking your bones. You decide which one. The destruction that Proverbs 16, 18 predicts comes as a result of a prideful person's unwillingness to change his or her course. Proverbs 16, 17 says, the highway of the upright avoids evil. Those who guard their ways preserve their life. Proverbs 16, 17, like a lot of wisdom literature does, looks at life as being a road. And you are going down a road when eventually, inevitably, you will experience a, a fork in the road. There will be one or two paths that you can take. One path leads to prosperity and success. The other path leads to destruction. Wisdom literature teaches us it's the wise person who knows which path in life to take. And the wise person knows which path in life to take simply because they are observant. They recognize the, the faults of other people and how to avoid them. The road that leads to destruction is clear to everyone. You will see the broken lives on that road. You will see the shattered relationships on that road. You will see the destruction on that road. It is obvious to everyone. It is obvious to everyone except the prideful person. A prideful person sees destruction, sees turmoil that has happened to other people, and argues to himself or herself that what happened to them won't happen to me. A prideful person thinks that they're smart enough to avoid the pitfalls of other people. A, smart, a prideful person thinks that they're more intelligent than the rest. That's why what has happened to so many other people won't happen to me. Tell me if you've heard this one before. I, I know what he did to, to other girls, but those other girls weren't me. I'm different. <laughs> Tell me if you've heard this one before. I, I know he got fired for doing the same thing, but I won't get fired from my job because I'm different. I'm smarter. Tell me if you've heard this one before. I, I, I know that person got hurt for doing the same thing I'm doing right now. I know that person got thrown in jail for doing the same thing, but I'm different. I'm smarter than that. A prideful person believes that they can avoid the dangers that come with pride, the same dangers that led to the destruction of other people because they are better or more equipped to handle those dangers. Bruce Waltke, in his commentary on Proverbs, writes, instead of looking where they are going, in defiance of the principle of wisdom, the arrogant raise their eyes above God and humanity and stumble to their perdition. A prideful person, regardless of how many bodies they see lying on the road, 
will always take the road that leads to destruction because they believe that they're better than other people. You, you see this principle exemplified in history. Hitler made the same mistake Napoleon did, which led to his greatest defeat. And remember when Michael Jordan was winning all those championships, I, I remember one year he, he was playing the Knicks in a playoff series. He scored 40 points one game, and Pat Riley and John Stark said, I refuse to double team him because one man cannot beat a team by himself. Four more 40 point games later, and the Knicks were out of the playoffs. Pride can make you think what has happened to other people won't happen to you. I have my own personal story of how pride can, can blind you. When I was in high school, my mother would always give me a, a Metro pass, roughly equivalent to a monthly MTA pass, and give me a Metro card and give me my allowance for the month. I was on the train one day, and I saw some guy, remember that game that they play where the guy is on the train and he's got the three cards and you're supposed to pick the, the ace? And I saw other people playing that game and other people losing their money. And while other people were losing their money, in my mind, I was picking the correct card all the time. I was looking from a distance. Oh, he got you again? You just stupid. If that was me, boy, I'd be walking out of here with a lot of money. Finally, he made the challenge to me. I'd watched other people lose all their money to him, but I thought to myself, I'm, I'm better than those other people. I'm smarter than those other people. I, I have a, at least a 33% chance of winning this game. And because of my intelligence, that 33% chance increases to 75% chance. I'm guaranteed to walk out of here with some money. So we first played for all the money that I have in my pocket. And predictably, I lost. And then we played for my Metro card. It, it was like the first or second of the month. I, I thought maybe that was just a bad mistake after all. I've got 75% chance of winning. Not only am I going to get my money back, but I'm also going to get more money in return. And we played for my Metro card, and I lost. That whole month, I had to walk to school and be hungry all day, all because I didn't learn my lesson from having watched other people fall into the same trap that I eventually did. And and the worst news about it is, three months later, he caught me, and it happened all over again. <laughs> Prideful people walk to their destruction because they believe that the same things that trap other people, they can avoid. Moreover, the destruction that prideful people face is assured because God won't have it any other way. Proverbs 3.34 says God opposes the prideful person. Here's what that means. All the energies of heaven are aimed against the prideful person. God will not let the prideful person succeed. God puts all of his energies towards making sure the prideful person falls making sure the prideful person falls hard. The problem of pride is guaranteed to lead to a, a painful end, a painful end that, that you and I can avoid. There is a, a prescription to pride. The opposite of, of pride is humility. And the prescription to pride is to develop a, a humble spirit, but that's easier said than done. If all of us could be humble, we would be. In fact, some of us are prideful about our perceived humility. Humility is more difficult to obtain than pride. And humility is only something that God can give. There is 
no humility without God. Galatians 6 says that humility is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Humility only comes from a genuine encounter with God. And, and there's two, th two ways that, that God can extend to us humility. In Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, Babylon has this dream. He dreams that he sees a, a tall tree who, that goes all the way to the sky. The branches of this tree hangs and touches the, the sky. One day, the tree, hears, he hears something in his dream where a messenger from God says, cut down that tree. That tree is cut down and only a stump of that tree is left. Confused, Nebuchadnezzar calls Daniel and asks Daniel to interpret that dream. Daniel says that the tree in question from that dream is actually the king, whose pride makes him think that he is touching the heavens. His pride makes him think that, that he is equal to God. And God will one day cut him down. And sure enough, God came and Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. He lost his kingdom for a period of time, lost his sanity and was forced to live in, in the woods eating grass until God one day restored him. One way that God can grant us humility is through the circumstances in our lives. Things in your life can get so difficult. Things in your life can be so impossible for you to overcome that you are humbled through your circumstances. You, you, you don't want God to humble you that way. But there's another way that God can humble you. The book of Proverbs, the major theme to the book of Proverbs is found in Proverbs 1.7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And throughout the book of Proverbs, humility is connected with wisdom. Those who properly fear God have wisdom, and those who have wisdom, have humility. Here's where God can aid you in your pursuit of humility. The humble person is one who has an extremely high view of God. It is impossible to see and recognize God for who he is and still be prideful. It is impossible to see how majestic God is to see how glorious God is, to see how awesome God is, and not be humbled in his presence. Last month, we, we spoke and reviewed together Psalm number eight, where the psalm says, psalmist says, what am I that you are mindful of me, God? And the psalmist has this humbled view of himself because he saw God as this magnificent creator of the stars and, and heaven. And, and, and we've been studying Philippians chapter 2 together. And, and in Philippians chapter 2, Paul exhorts us to be humble in spirit. But, but notice how we become humble in spirit. When we recognize Jesus as the all-sufficient, all-glorious king, the Jesus that whom every knee must bow down before. It's, it's impossible for us to have a high view of God and not be humbled. John Flavel, great preacher, once said, they that know God will be humble, and they that know themselves cannot be proud. If, if you truly know and understand God, if you truly see God for who he is, then the end of pride will be the result. Remember the life of the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul is, is perhaps one of the most humble figures in the history of the Christian faith. It's the Apostle Paul who writes that, may I never boast in anything except the cross of Christ. It's the, humble, it's the Apostle Paul who says he counts all of his past achievements as worthless compared to the surpassing knowledge of knowing Christ. It's the Apostle Paul who authored some of the most humbling words we've ever read. You, you know how he got there? Acts chapter 9 tells us that Apostle Paul, a, a different man than the one we know from Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians and Galatians, was, was 
walking, heading to Damascus to persecute Christians. That Paul was, was a prideful, boastful man who thought that it was up to him to carry out the work of God. And, and remember what happened on that Damascus road? Remember that, that Paul encountered the, the risen God in Jesus and, and Jesus humbled him by giving Paul this great and glorious vision of who he was and Paul's life was forever changed and central. That's my prayer for us this morning because whether you want to admit it or not, most of us, if not all of us, struggle with some area of pride in our lives. And you don't want God to have to, through experiences, through circumstances, humble you. What you'd rather have is God do what he did for Paul, give you a great vision of who he is, allow you to see God as being bigger than life and certainly bigger than yourself. And and it's only from having this great and glorious vision of who God is will we put an end to our pride and no longer walk down the path that leads to destruction. Will you pray with me? Lord, help us to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory so that we would put an end to our pride. Now we pray, Father God, that someone would make a decision to end pride in their lives through coming to know you through your son Jesus in a powerful way. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.